Elliot, uh, thank you very much. Um, so this gentleman certainly needs no introduction. Uh, my name is Mark Bezos, and uh, you're all welcome to call me what my friends do. They usually just refer to me as Jeff's brother. Uh, <laughs> so, by the way, just so you know, it actually does go both ways. My brother has a TED talk about small acts of kindness, uh, being a volunteer firefighter, and it has millions of views. And every once in a while, somebody will stop me and say, I love your TED talk about being a firefighter and small acts of kindness. And I, I, if I, I usually you know, say, well, thank you, but that's really my brother, his TED talk. But if I'm in a hurry, I, I just say thank you. Um, <laughs> but, uh, so thank you. Yes, absolutely. But if any of you do get confused, I'm the one with the smaller bank account uh, to your left. <laughs> He, so. He's the big brother. He's... <laughs> um, so, Jeff, before we get started, I think, you know, this is a, uh, obviously a crowd of uh, influential people, people who are starting out. I think we might as well just make the most of their time. I'm just going to dive right into this, uh, if you don't mind. Let's go. So, um, you uh, are captain of industry, Amazon.com, uh, private space flight with Blue Origin, the Washington Post, uh, levels of uh, you know, fame and, and wealth that are uh, hard to comprehend. I guess you know, one question that probably is at the top of everyone's mind is, if you had to choose one thing, what would you say is your favorite part of having me as a little brother? <laughs> <laughs> I've, taken, way, the, I've taken the liberty of uh, writing know, down some thoughts. I know with you. the answer to this. And, and, and there are many things I love about having Mark as a brother, but um, what he just did is number one at the top of the list. When I am <laughs> with my brother, I just laugh continuously yeah, because yeah. he is the funniest guy in my life. Well, thank you. You're, you're, you're an easy audience, and I appreciate I, it. I am actually so. an easy audience. That is true. He is. I am. All right. So, so here's what we're going to do, uh, if all of you uh, don't mind. So yeah. <clears throat> the fact that, you know, a fireside chat yeah. uh, among brothers, this is not unique for us. This no. is something that we do uh, quite often. It's rare that we have, uh, you know, a couple thousand of our closest friends with us. Yeah. And it's also we rare that we don't. We do it don't... in front of an audience, and we usually actually have a fire. Yes. And bourbon. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, which we don't have now. But no. So... Uh, and uh, uh, what, what we're going to talk about, the things that I'm going to chat with Jeff about, are not uh, the sorts of things, uh, perhaps, that you would hear uh, in most interviews, because, you know, I don't, you know, two pizza rules is not really my jam, so we're not going to talk about those things. But, you know, we do have a shared history, uh, you know, uh, so I, what I really want to focus on is, you know, the influences and the inspirations that have led to some of the things, the foundation of, uh, you know, yeah. what uh, This is, is a little base. intimidating. He knows way too much. It's... Uh, so, uh, and what I'd like to do is invite all of you to, to join in on, on, you know, what is uh, the, some of our greatest hits, I guess, from my point of view. Um, and because we have such a shared history, uh, what I've done, um, much to Jeff's chagrin, is I've gone through uh, and taken the liberty of pulling together a bunch of family photos. Um, so, I'm going to be throwing some of those up uh, behind us, and just so that you guys can, uh, you know, sort of understand. So if we start talking shorthand, you'll understand uh, what it is that we're referring to. So, all sound good? All right. So I am going to, and I appreciate your patience. This is not the sort of thing that I usually do, so I appreciate your patience. So uh, we're just going to dive right into it. So when we were kids, we would spend every summer on our grandfather's ranch in South Texas. Yeah. Uh, we called our grandfather Pop. That's Pop. There's Pop right there. We were probably just fixing that windmill. Yes, <laughs> always fixing windmills. Yeah. Um, before you were climbing them and smashing bottles upon them, uh, <laughs> which you did That's... recently in an Instagram video. So, you know, one of the things that we, uh, that we would do, um, you know, every summer, it was really a magical experience. There's little Jeff. Yeah. That was my maximum cuteness right there. <laughs> By the way, all downhill from there, that... <laughs> That's a 1962 International Harvester Scout. We all learned to drive yes, in that car. That car. Once Absolutely. you can drive that car, you can drive anything. <laughs> that. Um, and then this is, uh, so there's uh, the that, two of us. That is Jeff teaching me how to open or close a uh, gate, which doesn't seem like it would be that complicated, but I was having trouble with it. Wire gap so. gates are tough. Um, 
And then this is, uh, this is that's you. red. Well, that's Christina. Our yeah, sister. that's our sister Christina. But the, the horse, horse is red. That's red. That's yeah. Uh, so I guess one of the things that that we learned There's every pop. summer. Yeah. yeah, this is pop again. So there was uh, as we as we alluded to with the windmills, there was always work to be done on the ranch. Uh, and yeah, one of the the things that you know I think we learned to value, and and you've spoken about this uh, in the past, is the the uh, the role that resourcefulness, self-reliance yeah, plays, sure. it, it's certainly on a, on a, in in a place like the ranch. But yeah. uh, can you talk a little bit about... Well, so one of the great things that you learn, and first of all, we had a very fortunate, lucky childhood. We got to spend a lot of time with Pop and our grandparents, and you learn different things from grandparents than you learn from parents. It's just a very different relationship. I spent all my summers on his ranch from age 4 to 16, and... Um, he was incredibly self-reliant. You know, if you're in the middle of nowhere in a rural area, you don't pick up the phone and call somebody when something breaks. You figure out how to fix it yourself. And so you, as a kid, you got to, I got to see him solve all these problems and be a real problem solver. He even did his own veterinary work. He would make his own needles for the, to suture up the cattle with. He would, like, take a piece of wire, use a blowtorch to heat it up, pound it flat, sharpen it, drill a hole through it, make a needle. And some of the cattle even survived. Um, <laughs> and so, it, you know, but, but you did, we learned a lot of things um, from watching him uh, because he would, he, he would take on major projects that he didn't really know how to do but, and well, then figure out how to do them. You know, a good example of that is, uh, you know, you guys built a house. Yeah. I, yeah. think, I think he bought this out of a Sears catalog. It was a kit house, um, and uh, we built that thing. Somebody came out. It all showed up in big boxes, and somebody, a professional came out and poured the foundation, and then we did the rest of it. But, um, yeah, that, but was, I'm pretty sure that was quite a I, project. In going there are some the, of the, you can see some of the cows there that didn't survive the uh, <laughs> procedure. And, so, uh, but, you know, when I was uh, going through these, uh, it certainly, uh, I came across this photo. Um, oh, which, God, yeah. I'm not exactly sure what it was you were doing here, but know. I'm almost positive you were like doing that, it wrong. Maybe that vent really pissed me off. I don't know. That's uh, certainly... Well, I think there's a couple of things here. First of all, OSHA would not be pleased with no. uh, the way you're on that ladder. And it no. appears as though you've, you're crafting a spear. I don't know um, what I'm doing. Yeah. So, uh, and, you know, I think that, um, you know, if you can talk a little bit, I know that there's, uh, you know, this, this bulldozer in the background. Yeah. That's uh, a D6 a funny part of. Caterpillar bulldozer that my grandfather bought used for $5,000, which is an enormous bargain. You know, this thing, it should cost way more than that. The reason it was so cheap is it was completely broken. The transmission was stripped, <laughs> the hydraulics didn't work. And so we spent basically a whole summer repairing it, and, and um, big giant gears would arrive by mail order from Caterpillar, and we would, you know, we couldn't even move the gears. So my, the first thing my grandfather did was build a crane to move the gears. So that's that kind of you know, self-reliance and resourcefulness. And the, um, you know, there's also, uh, there's a, a, a story that, that, you know, is, is a somewhat legendary in our family. Uh, one of the things that Pop did uh, one summer. Uh, it was a little out of character. Oh, I know what story you're talking about. Um, so he really actually was a very careful, conservative sort of person, um, not prone to crazy acts or anything. He was kind of introspective and even and very even introverted, quiet person. But one day, he was all by himself. He had driven to the ranch, and he was at the main gate to the ranch, and he forgot to put the car in park. And so when he got to the gate, he noticed that the car was slowly rolling downhill toward the gate. He thought, this is fantastic. I have just enough time to unlatch the gate, throw the gate open. The car is going to drive right through. And those will be wonderful. He almost got the gate unlatched when the car hit the gate, and it caught his thumb between the gate and the fence post, and it stripped all the flesh off of his thumb. It was hanging there by a tiny little thread, and uh, he was so angry at himself that he ripped that piece of flesh off and threw it in the brush, got back in the car, drove himself to the emergency room in Dilly, Texas, 16 miles away. And when he got there, they said, this is great. We can reattach that. Where is it? And he said, oh, I threw it in the brush. They drove back with the nurses and everybody. And they all, they looked for hours for the thumb. And they never found that piece of flesh, something probably eaten it. 
So they, <laughs> they take him back to the emergency room, and they said, look, um, uh, you have two choices. You're going to have to have a skin graft for that, and we can sew your, your thumb to your stomach and leave it there for six weeks. That's the best way to do it. Or we can just cut a piece of skin graft from your butt and just suture it on, and it won't ever be as good, but the advantage is your thumb won't be sewn to your stomach for six weeks. <laughs> and um, he said, I'll take option two, just do the skin graft from my butt. And um, they did that. It was very successful. It worked fine. And he, he, but the funniest thing about this story is that I have incredibly vivid memories, and we all do, of him. And he was, definitely his mornings were completely ritualized. He would wake up, eat breakfast cereal, read the newspaper, and shave with an electric razor for a really long time. Like, he would shave with that electric razor for like 15 minutes <laughs> and, uh, while he was eating his cereal. And, doing, and when he was done shaving his face with that razor, then he would take two quick passes over his thumb because his thumb grew butt hair. <laughs> and, but, but, which, by the way, did not bother him at all. No. He was completely unfazed yeah, by it. unfazed. So, uh, thumb, butt hair aside, uh, you know, the, uh, the value of resourcefulness, yeah. right, and, um, and <laughs> self-reliance, how, how do you apply that to, um, you know, the work that you do on a daily basis? How do you... Well, I think, in, you know, there are a lot of entrepreneurs and, and people pursuing dreams and passions in this crowd, and you know, you always... You, you, the, the whole point of, uh, of moving things forward is you run into problems, you run into failures, things don't work, you have to back up and try again. Each one of those times when you have a setback and you back up and you try again, you're using resourcefulness, you're using self-reliance, you're trying to invent your way out of a box. And um, I have, we have tons of examples at Amazon where we've had to do this, we've failed so many times, we have, I always think of us as a great place to fail because we're good at it. We have so much practice. <laughs> and I get, just to give you one example, we, many years ago now, we started, we wanted a third party uh, selling business because we knew we could add selection to the store that way. And uh, we started Amazon auctions. Nobody came. I think maybe our mother is the only one who purchased something. I on bought Amazon a coffee auctions. cup. You bought a coffee cup? I did. Okay. So I there did. were two purchasers. And, um, uh, and and, that, so, and then we, so we said, well, what can we do? We opened this thing called Z Shops, we tra which was like fixed price auctions. Again, nobody came. I didn't use that. And then finally, <laughs> and each one of these failures is like a year, year and a half long. And so we're trying to invent new things. And we finally came across this idea of, of putting the uh, third party selection on the same detail pages, the same product detail pages that we had our own inventory on, our own retail inventory on. We, we called this Marketplace. And it started working right away. And, or, so that just that resourcefulness of trying new things, figuring things out, what the customers really want, it, yeah. it pays off in everything. And it pays off even in your daily lives. You know, how do you help your children? What's the right thing? My wife has a great saying. We let our kids use, even now, now they're 17 through 12. But even when they were four, we would let them use sharp knives. And by the time they were, I don't know, maybe seven or eight, we would let them use certain power tools. And my wife... Uh, much to her credit, she has this great say. She says, I would much rather have a kid with nine fingers than a resourceless kid. Um, and which I just think is a fantastic attitude about life. Well, luckily, you have resourceful kids with ten fingers each. Yeah, so no, far the they have so all far, their so fingers. Yeah, we'll see. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, I know that resourcefulness uh, is so uh, important. You actually... There it she was is. A, it was a prerequisite That's for the, the selection of a spouse, right? So this is... Yeah, I had, I, in my 20s, this is, you know, way, you know, pre-Tinder, pre-match.com. And so I had this, I, I, at a certain point, I decided I wanted to, to get married. And I had all my friends setting me up, and I had my list of criteria. And this was like good old-fashioned blind dates. I went on dozens of blind dates. And um, it turned out I kept meeting people who were professional blind daters. And I sort of became a professional blind dater. <laughs> And so we would sit down, and most of the conversation was quickly about how, yeah, we're not right for each other, but how do you meet people? And, you know, it was actually turned into a very good... But when I was telling my friends my criteria, one of the ones that I would list was that I wanted a woman who could get me out of a third-world prison. And 
my friends were like, what are your future plans? You know, like, what? <laughs> what? And, and I said, no, it's just a visualization for somebody really resourceful because it, I think that you don't want to go through life with teammates who aren't resourceful. Um, and so you do want to go through life with people who, if you need, could get you out of a third world prison. <laughs> hypothetically um, speaking. Hypothetically speaking. Yeah. So, you know, uh, so this is a picture uh, from... That's a recent photo. Yeah, that was last summer, I think. Yeah. Uh, we took that. We were on a family vacation. And, I, you know, so this one uh, jumped out at me because, uh, you know, you're doing McKinsey curls there uh, <laughs> with, your, with your wife. And you're looking a little buff. And so that, of course, you know, made me think of this. Oh. <laughs> now, as internet memes go, Swole Jeff is pretty cool, right? <laughs> so, you know, if Swole Mark raced across the internet, I'd be pretty psyched. But, you know, I, 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 this got sent to me by so many people, variations of this, right? Oh my God, your brother looks awesome, your brother looks awesome. Yeah, I know, I know. And then, uh, you know, it, but it confused me. Because, in all honesty, this is what I grew up with. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. I'm just saying, right? So, that. you know, when, yeah. I, when you guys saw Swole Jeff, I was like, uh, I, I was surprised too, right? I mean, yeah. this is... Yeah, this, I mean, sexy, right? That, yeah. I mean, that, I, I, I remember that. I am... Um, how old That's are you a here? Halloween costume. I am one of. I had some friends, and we went as the fruit. Oh of the no, no, no! Hold. Wait, 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 wait. There you go. There we go. <laughs> that is. Yeah, yeah. The the the, the chicks, They went as the lady chicks, killers. Chicks loved that. They loved that. That we were, we were very successful in high school. <laughs> <laughs> we, so uh, as fitness goes, and then, and then, you know, there was this guy who's like, what, late 90s Jeff, right? Yeah, this something is, like that. Yeah. And, uh, you know, your eating habits at this point in your life were not great. No. My, this is, um, this is, you won't even believe this story. You're just going to have to believe me that I tell you this is true. Um, when my wife and I got married, uh, I had been eating a whole can, for a couple of years, I had been eating for breakfast every morning a whole can of Pillsbury biscuits. So I would wake up in the morning, I would uh, preheat the oven to 375, I would get out the, the bacon, the baking sheet, I would crack open the Pillsbury biscuits, place them on there, and with butter. And I would eat the whole, whole can. And I was skinny as real, and um, it was... Just, and I, and my, after watching me, with, so then we get married, and she watched me do this every morning as my spouse for like three months. And then she finally stopped me one day, and she said, do you know what's in that? <laughs> and I was like, honestly, that wasn't even a concept for me, that there was something in food. You know, that there was like a, um, I had never read a nutrition label in my life. I ate what tasted good to me. <laughs> <laughs> and um, uh, so she kind of showed me the ingredients label, and we had a little very rudimentary discussion about nutrition, and I stopped eating the biscuits. Well, I'm uh, frankly very happy and somewhat surprised that you survived all of that. <laughs> <laughs> We're glad you're still with us. So she was incredulous. She couldn't <laughs> believe it. So one of the, the things I want to talk about, a question that, that we've talked about before, you were 30 years old in 1994 when yeah. uh, you decided to start Amazon.com. Mm -hmm. uh, you had a great job. You had, I remember you had a great apartment on the Upper West Side. Been married um, for a year. You'd been married for a I year. I had not been eating biscuits for nine months. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I'm just, you know, how did you go through making the decision to uh, drop what was a very good job and take, it, take this chance. It all seems very obvious now, right? This many years later that it paid off, but at the time it was not obvious. No, no it wasn't. And, I, and, and um, I did do a lot of soul searching. I, I went to my boss at the time and I really liked my job. And I told my boss I was gonna go do this thing, start an internet bookstore. And um, 
my wife had I'd already told my wife, and she's like, great, let's go. Um, and I, I said to my boss, I was gonna do this. he's like, this is a good idea. He said, I think this is a good idea, but it would be an even better idea for somebody who didn't already have a good job. And that sort of made some logical sense to me, and he convinced me to think about it for a couple of days, so I went away, and I was really trying to get my head around how to think about this. And I think, for me, the right way to make that kind of very personal decision, because those decisions are personal, they're not like data-driven business decisions. They're, they are, you know, what does your heart say? And for me, it was, I could, the best way to think about it was to project myself forward to age 80, and say, look, when I'm 80 years old, I want to have minimized the number of regrets that I have. I don't want to be 80 years old in a quiet moment of reflection, thinking back over my life and, and cataloging a bunch of major regrets. And I think that regrets are biggest regrets in most cases. You can murder somebody, okay, you'd regret that. But in most cases, <laughs> our biggest regrets turn out to be acts of omission. It's paths not taken, and they haunt us. We wonder, what would have happened I loved that person, and I never told them. And then they married somebody else. I, did, you know, I didn't do this. And so that's the frame of mind that I put myself in. And, I, and once I did that, once I thought about it that way, it was immediately obvious to me. I knew that when I'm 80, I would never regret trying this thing that I was super excited about and failing. If it failed, fine. I would be very proud of the fact when I'm 80 that I tried. And I also... Um, knew that I, it would always haunt me if I didn't try. And so that would be a regret. It would be a 100% chance of a regret if I didn't try and basically a 0% chance of regret if I tried and failed. So I think that's a useful metric for any important life decision. And this is, uh, this is you know, my, our sister took this photo um, but, you know, she was, uh, I don't understand, quite know why she thought this was a momentous occasion. You, you, this is you at McKinsey. Yeah, we're about to take off driving across the country to, to start Amazon, go to Seattle. Uh, and that's That's your my dog. yellow lab, Kamala, named that's, after a Star so, Trek character. We're so happy to have these family photos, but we can't for the life of us figure out why Christina bothered to take them. But we're so glad she did. And then, you know, she also was smart enough to tell you to leave the dog. Yeah, she saved us probably because I, we were going to drive across the country with the dog, which was probably not a good idea. Yeah. So she said, why don't I keep the dog? And after you guys get settled, I'll send you the dog. So uh, what, what, a question I have um, is, you know, we just talked about the fact that, you know, there was certainly no guarantee that Amazon was going I mean, to work. No, there never is um, any kind of startup. I, I think, and what would... Jeff Bezos be doing if, if this hadn't worked out? I, I, I think I, I don't, it's a good question. Nobody ever really knows what their life, what twists and turns life takes. My best guess is I would be a very happy software engineer. Yeah. And it, working on anything in particular? Well, today I might be, I don't know, I'm very, very curious about machine learning and artificial intelligence, and, and at Amazon we're doing a lot of that. Probably I would be attracted to that yeah. field today. Uh, and if, you know, I, I, I thought of this question, I, I'm not sure exactly how you would answer it, but I am curious to know, like, your fantasy job, not the one that would pay the bills. Well, but that it, I have. I have, is you, and you know what it is. I think I, he knows. My guess the, is bartender. Yeah. I, and I, I do have, by the way, I'm really glad I'm wearing my Honey Badger Don't Care uh, T-shirt there. It, and that, thank you for that photo, because it looks like I've had about four of those yeah, already. I think, I don't, um, I appreciate that. I and mean, that looks that. like a Bloody Mary. What's, That's an early start. What are brothers for? That's um, an early start. Uh, but, yeah, I have this. You make a mean cocktail. I, I do. I, do. I, I pride myself on my craft cocktails. And I, I, um, and I, ha I do have this fantasy that I want to be a bartender. And I know that it is a fantasy. Like, if I were actually a bartender, they're probably, like, it's, I've glamorized the job in my mind. I know that. <laughs> but... But I love people. I like talking to people. Um, I love making cocktails. You're not um, very fast. I'm super slow. It would have to be a to be craft a very slow cocktail bar. bar. We'd have to charge a lot per drink, and they would, and you'd be, you know, there'd be a big sign behind the bar that says you can have it good or you can have it fast, which you want, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing. But, but yeah, I have a, I have a kind of fantasy there. Um, so uh, if we could shift gears a little bit, I want to talk about Blue Origin. Yeah. 
so Blue Origin is your uh, private space flight, commercial space flight company. Uh, and uh, we'll talk in a minute about all the, the work that, that uh, you're doing in that regard. But I guess what I want to focus on uh, for a minute or two is the inspiration for that, the passion yeah. behind it. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm going to put up a photo now, and th this one's really more embarrassing for me than for you. But uh, so here we are. This you is look your... like you're about to block a soccer kick or something. I don't, it's a... <laughs> you're... I'm auditioning for Alan. And that's and the our, on the mind. far right there is our dad. That's Chico and the man over there Chico. on the right. He, he uh, is, uh, he's Cuban, and it's a kind of, you know, it's one of those tricks that the universe plays on you that uh, my mom's name is Jackie and my name is Jeff, and there's no J in Spanish. And so he still has to call her Yaki and me Yef. And, um, uh, but he sounds exactly like Ricky Ricardo and is a delightful guy. But yeah, that's the whole crew there. That's the whole crew there. So uh, you were uh, the valedictorian of your high school uh, in Miami and uh, had the opportunity to uh, give a speech yep. at your graduation. And you, I think the vast majority of your speech was about colonizing space. I think all of it. I think all of it as well. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. and I, I still remember your closing line. I mean, even then, it stood out to me. Yeah. Uh, and it was, uh, do you remember it? I do. I, re I remember the closing. It was something like, um, space, the final frontier, meet me there. That was it. That was, <laughs> yeah. So, and I've been passionate about space, rockets, and rocket engines since I was a five-year-old boy. And so, you know, I want to talk about that a little bit because, you know, we've talked about, or, you know, it, certainly the story you've told about having seen uh, the moon landing in 1969, right? So this is Pop again. That's Christina, right? That's our sister uh, on the floor. So this was a very familiar setting for us. Anytime Pop was watching TV, he was yeah. laying on the floor. He had perfectly good furniture. I could see it, but... Yeah, no, he uh, liked he to lay on the floor laid on the floor to, to watch television. Yeah. And you remember a scene exactly like this when you were watching um, the lunar landing. Yeah. No, he, he, he yeah, that was his posture. Yeah, and I, I do think, you never know exactly, you know, you don't choose your passions, your passions choose you, how, you, how they are formed, you're never completely sure. But I do think you get imprinted somehow early on with certain things, you just get excited about them. And because you're excited, you pay more attention and they grow. Um, and that's, space is like that for me. I watched Neil Armstrong step onto the moon when I was five. And, you know, I, I, I do wonder, I know that um, Pop was a big fan of the Watergate trials, also yeah, watched I, those in the yeah, I, I same watched setting. Just like this. I, yeah. He was kind of a news junkie anyway, but he, religious, he obsessively watched the uh, Watergate hearings. I, you know, do you think at some level that might have influenced you it, at least by the post? Yeah, I'm just be. curious about It's hard to know. Um, you know, I bought the post because I think it's an important institution. And, uh, you know, I told the team at the time, like, you know, I, it, it, the, the post at the time um, had, was kind of financially upside down, had a lot of work to do, no fault of their own. The Internet had really taken the wind out of, um, out of newspaper companies. And I said, look, you know, I would not buy a, 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 a financially upside down salty snack food company. Um, but the Post is a real institution that I think matters and, and uh, needs some runway. So that's why I did it. Got I it. happened to know the guy who had owned it for so many years, yeah. Don Graham, who's just an amazing person. Um, and so that all worked out. But did watching the Watergate hearings with Pop on the carpet have influence on that? Probably. Right, at some level. You know? So um, going back to, to Blue Origin, I mean, you know, space has been such a, My a big part of your life uh, for so long. And certainly every memory. That's in uh, Houston. We lived in Houston for many years. That was a park years. not too far from our house. I think yeah. that, uh, you know, it's science fiction, science fiction movies, books, uh, you know, I've my passion for that stuff certainly came from, uh, you know, watching you enjoy it so much. But, you know, I look at this picture and, uh, you know, I, I thought to myself, well, I've seen uh, that face recently. Uh, <laughs> and it's, and this, so this is, uh, you're standing on the landing pad. Yeah. In West Texas, uh, the launch and landing site in West Texas, yeah. where you're do, launching uh, and landing uh, new the New Shepard vehicle yep. for Blue Origin. Mm -hmm. So if you could just... Take a minute or two and uh, sort of 
help us understand, what is Blue Origin up to? Well, um, Blue Origin is, the vision for Blue Origin is millions of people living and working in space. And the key thing is we have to dramatically reduce the cost of access to space. Right now, space travel is very expensive. And the reason it's expensive is not hard to understand. It's because we throw the hardware away after each use. And so we need reusable rocket vehicles. And that's what Blue Origin is working on. We're working on um, making sure that we don't have to throw the plane away every time after you fly you know, to your vacation destination. That would definitely increase the cost of your vacation. And, um, and so uh, that's what we need to do. And we can do it. It's totally possible. Uh, and I think it's, I think it's important. Yeah, uh, this, is, uh, this is what the booster looks like when it's coming back down. Yeah. Um, uh, and and uh, this is, uh, again, coming back My down. My cowboy hat still has sh champagne stains. Which, That's uh, right, your hat still has the best champagne. kind of stains. So, you know, I guess, you know, if we could talk, and uh, this is one of my favorite shots. This is the booster in, in And that's West, West Texas. Texas. It's, it's beautiful country. So uh, if you could just talk a little bit about, um, you know, you've been passionate about space your whole life. Yep. But, you know, this is not just a plaything for you. No, the God, work no. that Blue Origin is doing is not, you know, a no. nice thing. I mean, no. you actually, this is an important work. I, my view is like is that it's it's incredibly important work that um, needs to be done and done as quickly as possible and I have my own reasons why I believe that but they can be explained pretty simply and it's not for me it's not the um, there's a very uh, kind of common argument that's been around for a long time actually kind of first popularized by Arthur C Clarke who said all civilizations become spacefaring or extinct and this is the kind of Plan B argument that, you know, when Earth is destroyed somehow, um, we better make sure that we don't have all of our eggs in one basket. And I hate the Plan B argument. Um, I think, you know, Plan B with respect to Earth being destroyed is make sure Plan A works. So we have sent robotic probes to every planet in this solar system. Believe me, this is the best one. <laughs> we know that. It's not even close. You know, my friends who say they want to uh, move to Mars or something, I say, like, why don't you go live in Antarctica for a year first? Because it's a garden paradise compared to Mars. <laughs> and um, so we really, this, is the, this planet is so amazing. It's a jewel in our solar system. And we have, uh, if you take baseline energy usage on Earth, and just compound it at a few percent a year for just a few hundred years, you have to cover the entire Earth's surface in solar cells. So that's not going to happen. So we have two choices. We either go out into space, or we switch over to a civilization of stasis. And personally, I do not like the idea of stasis. You know, we have... Uh, we, it, it's, it, we, our grandchildren and their grandchildren will live in a much better world if they can continue to advance and develop and use more energy um, and, and all of the things that we've enjoyed for hundreds of years as a civilization of growth. I don't even really believe in stasis. I think things are either growing or shrinking. I, don't, I think stasis is highly, highly uh, unusual and, and, and real life doesn't exist. I don't even think liberty is consistent with the idea of stasis. I mean, if you get real stasis, somebody's going to have to tell you how many kids you can have, how much energy you can use. There'll be all kinds of things that just aren't consistent with, with liberty and freedom. So, but in space, we have, for all practical purposes, unlimited resources. We could have a trillion humans in the solar system uh, and wouldn't, still wouldn't be crowded. Um, and so then if you had a trillion humans, you'd have a thousand Einsteins and a thousand Mozarts and a thousand Da Vinci's. And how cool would that be? But we have to go to space. And we have to go to space to save Earth. That's why this work is so important. And we don't have forever to do it. We've now gotten so big as a civilization on Earth that we kind of have to hurry. And so I believe that, um, that, you know, that, that really in a kind of a long time frame, the most important work I'm doing is, is Blue Origin and pushing forward to get humanity established in the solar system.
So, uh, in what sort of time frame are we talking about? Well, the grand vision, you know, a trillion humans uh, in the solar system and so on, that's, I mean, that's hundreds of years. Um, but, you know, but in, in, in we can have, in just a couple of decades, I think we can have much lower cost space travel, and then we can start to, um, you know, have really a dynamic entrepreneurial explosion in space. You know, you can't really have much entrepreneurial activity in space today because the just the basic price of admission is too expensive. I mean, just to do anything, even something relatively small in space, is still very, very expensive. We need to lower the cost of admission so that thousands of entrepreneurs can have companies in space, kind of like what we've seen on the internet. Right now, you can't be, two kids in a dorm room can make Facebook, but they can't make a space company. It's not practical. We want to, I want to make that practical. Gotcha. So, you know, and, and you know, that, leads me to think about some of the conversations we've had. Uh, this is another view of those mountains uh, in, in West Texas, um, you know, sitting around that fire pit. And some of the most profound conversations, for me anyway, that, that we've had are around the topic of long-term thinking. Yeah. Uh, which is something that you've really embraced and, uh, you know, you've brought to the businesses that you run. Uh, yeah. And, you know, I was wondering if you could just Talk a little bit of that. I don't think that most people who are running uh, businesses or who are, you know, making, even starting a company like Blue Origin allow themselves to think in centuries, uh, even for visions, uh, for a vision of what they're creating. Uh, or, you know, at, at Amazon, I know that you've said, you know, five to seven year time frames for experiments that you're running. Uh, you know, where does, talk to me about long term thinking and your, your point of view on. Well, long term thinking is a lever, it lets you do things that you could not do. Um, or couldn't even conceive of doing if you were thinking short term. So if I, you know, that's why, you know, the, I have a project where I'm um, helping a group of people build the t a 10,000 year clock. It kind of ticks once a year and dongs once a century and the cuckoo comes out once a millennium. It's a, it's a big 500 foot tall thing inside a mountain right here. <laughs> inside one of those in mountains. This mountain range. And the 10,000 year clock is a symbol. I don't think it'll do anything for the first few hundred years. But after a few hundred years, once it's old, people start to pay attention to older symbols. And um, so a few hundred years from now, I hope that people will think about that as a symbol for long-term thinking. If I, you know, if, if, if I collaborated with somebody here in this audience and I said, look, I want you to solve world hunger, and I want you to do it in five years, you would properly reject the opportunity. You would say, look, it's not possible, it's not practical. But if I said, look, I want you to solve world hunger in 100 years, that's a job you'd take because it's a much more addressable problem. You can first create the conditions. You have time to create the conditions where then you can solve the problem. And so that's, that's a very important way of thinking. And, um, and, I, I find, and, it's, and it works with everything. I mean, you have to back up and find the right time horizon for what you're trying to do. But, you know, at Amazon, we probably do most of our things. We expect the, to get some results in sort of five, six, seven, eight years. But we find a lot of our, uh, you know, other companies that compete against us in various ways, they're often trying to get things done in, you know, two or three years. And so we can do things that... You know, if, you, if, you, if everything has to work in two to three years, then that limits what you can do. If you give yourself the, the breathing room to say, okay, I'll, I, I'm okay if it takes seven years, all of a sudden you have way more opportunities. The, um, one of the things I want to shift to uh, here is um, when, when we are uh, raising a glass uh, around a, the fire, um, and you usually have a toast. That, a standard that, toast. A standard toast that you usually kick off the night with. Yeah. And it's... To adventure and fellowship. To adventure and fellowship. Um, and literally, that's like the toast uh, that he kicks off uh, just about every dinner with, right? Every dinner, every night. And it's, you know, it's interesting to me because I know that you are uh, somebody who uh, pays attention to the words that, that you use, right? You're, you're careful uh, about the words that you use, and those seem like very specific words. Uh, so I was wondering if we could just talk a little bit about why adventure and why fellowship. And as I was thinking about this, uh, you know, it, it occurred to me that you've been uh, taking some adventures, uh, you know, throughout <laughs> your, your whole life. Here you that's are. That's our grandmother, Nanny. Yeah, that's Nanny. 
And you know, when you were a kid, you used to take uh, road trips with yeah. Nanny and We Pop. did the Wally Byram Caravan Club road trips, you know, 300 Airstream trailers here. Um, yeah, all driving down the highway together. Then we'd park This in was these before they were hipster cool. Big wagon wheel formations. Yeah, there was no avocado toast at this time. <laughs> Um, and, uh, and, you know, you and I had the, the, uh, good, uh, the fun opportunity. We drove across the country uh, yeah, not you too and, long yeah, ago. Oh, yeah, and the Defender. In the, yeah, that the, was a great, that was an amazing trip. That was a that very was really fun trip. Uh, and then, you know, we also, uh, we spent three days on horseback. That was a 50-mile ride in 50, West Texas. Yeah. Three days, super fun. My butt hurt. Yeah. I, I apologize about the quality. Like I said, this is not what I do, so this is the best I can do here. But I did take this picture. That's Jeff sleeping uh, on that trail ride. It was uh, cold. This is um, that ring of, you can see how I'm keeping that pillow from my, it's, this is when you know it's really good to be a mammal. Um, yeah. you provide your, your own heat. Provide your own body heat and keep <laughs> the frost away from your face. I guess, I guess, you know, all of these adventures, you know, I, 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 this is, this is, uh, you're dropping down into a cave. Yeah, that's uh, me re repelling down. It, that was really fun. That you was, were on that trip. I was on that trip, too. Uh, you know, but, so, you know, people have asked me this, you know, because they know that we, we go on a lot of adventures together, and uh, they're a bit incredulous when I, when I answer the question, but they ask me, you know, is he on his phone the whole time? Can he ever <laughs> unplug? Uh, and they're incredulous when I say, honestly, he's not on his phone that much. He's just, you know, when you, you're just, you're, I mean, we drove across the country, and, you know, it's not that you didn't do the work, but most of the time it was, it was this. Yeah. And I see the same thing when you're, you know, with your kids, and, you know, it's, how do you, I don't have a fraction of the responsibility that you do, and I find that I'm always wrestling with, you know, my phone. I'm just curious, like, what sort of discipline or what sort of, you know, how do you go about compartmentalizing the way I that think you do? I, and I, I, I do not. So, like, when I have dinner, I have dinner, whether it's with friends or with my family. And I, I like to, if I'm, I like to be talking to the people I'm with. I like to do whatever I'm doing. I don't like to multitask. It, it bothers me. If I'm reading my email, I want to be really reading my email. Um, when I, my um, mom tells a story about, uh, me being in Montessori school, and they, they w couldn't get me to switch tasks. So the Montessori school teacher would have to literally pick up my chair and just move me to the next task station. So I don't know, it's not like... It's, it's not intentional. It, it doesn't need, I don't need discipline in order to not be checking my email. For me, it's very natural. I love being present in what I'm working. And I'm, I'm, I'm happy multitasking, but I do it serially. You know, I will spend... And then, and you know, you know, honestly, if something really important is happening, somebody will find me. You know, it's not right. like I have to check my text messages every five minutes or something like that. It's not, that's not a, not a big deal. Right. Um, and, uh, and usually when they do find you, it's rarely to give you good news. Oh, yeah. No, if somebody comes and says, you need to check your text messages right now, that's got to be bad news. But that's <laughs> usually, actually, honestly, you know, it's usually a, a family thing. It's like a medical thing or right. something. It's like... Um, but it's not, I, I think that uh, it's probably just a very personal decision. I think some people are very good at multitasking, um, and so they can do two things yeah. at once. And, you know, I, I'm at a restaurant um, with my wife or something, and we'll see uh, a couple both texting, but every once in a while they show each other their phones, and it seems like they're having a very nice date. So I'm not sure there's anything wrong with that. Right. It's just not how I'm wired. Got it. So, you know, going back to, you know, the sense of adventure, uh, you know, what, can you talk to me a little bit about what the, the role that adventure plays in, in your life? Uh, and, you know, what to is it totally. that it brings to you? It's, it's more than well, just a distraction. Yeah, but, no, I, so that, when I say to Adventure Fellowship, for me, adventure is a, um, you can choose. We all get to choose our life stories, and um, it's the choices that define us, not our gifts. Everybody in this room has many gifts. Um, I have many gifts. You can never be proud of your gifts because they're gifts. They were given to you. You might be you know, tall, and, or you might be really good at math, or you might be extremely beautiful or handsome, or, you know, there, or there are many gifts, and you can only be proud really of your choices. 
because those are the things that you are that you're that you are acting on and one of the most important choices that each of us has and you know this just as well as I do is um, you can choose a life of ease and comfort or you can choose a life of service and adventure and when you're 80 which one of those things do you think you're going to be more proud of? You're going to be more proud of having chosen a life of service and adventure. You see this in your firefighting work and everything yeah. else you do, Robin Hood and so on and so on. And I feel that that is, a, you know, for me, adventure is a shorthand way of, of thinking about that. Got it. And I think that one of the other things that we've talked about when we talk about adventure is you know, exposing yourself to new things, right? And, and you know, maintaining that childlike sense of wonder. Totally. And, you know, I know that, uh, you know, this is important to you, certainly in, in uh, our personal lives, which is why we do all of these uh, f fun things, but it also plays an important role in, uh, you know, how you approach the businesses that you're involved in. The, if you want to be an inventor of any kind, inventing a new, you know, a new service offering for customers or a new product or anything, the, being an inventor requires, because the world is so complicated, you have to be a domain expert. I mean, in a way, even if, even if you're not at the beginning, you have to learn, 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 learn enough so that you become a domain expert. But the danger is once you become a domain expert, you can be trapped by that knowledge. And so inventors have this paradoxical ability to have that you know, 10,000 hours of practice and be a real domain expert and have that beginner's mind, have that that look at it freshly, even though they know so much about the domain. And that's the key um, to, to inventing. You, you have to have both. And I think that is intentional. I think all of us have that inside of us, and we can all do it, but you have to be intentional about it. You have to say, yeah, I am going to become an expert, and I'm going to keep my beginner's mind. And I know that, I mean, this is so important. You're, you're always, you know, it's, it's a regular refrain, even at Amazon, this far into it, that it's still day one. Day one. Um, so, uh, you know, one of the, so I guess the other half of that toast is, you know, to fellowship. Yeah. Right? To adventure and fellowship. And again, fellowship is a very specific word, right? You know, friendship is much more common. So what, why did you, like, what about, what is it about fellowship? For um, me, the word fellowship conjures a vision of traveling down the road together. It's a, it's a, it has more journey in it yeah. um, than friendship. I, friendship would be, is great and would be great too, but fellowship captures friendship and traveling that path together. This was, uh, so this is down at the bottom oh, of the cave. Oh, there we are. Yeah. yeah. There's our Some brother. Friends. There's Mackenzie, our brother-in-law, Steve. Yeah. Uh, friend Danny. That was um, a great, great trip. That was, that was quite the You adventure. don't have to worry about checking your phone there. No. No. This definitely is, not. No radio signals down there. But, you know, another uh, uh, adventure, I guess, an opportunity for adventure and, and fellowship. Uh, oh, that, that was had a fun was, trip. Was this trip. Um, and, you know, we were out at sea for 30 days. Yeah. Um, and we did this. When you've been out at sea for 30 days, this looks like it's in focus. Um, so, but why don't you, you know, can you talk a little bit about what we were? <coughs> Excuse me. And by no, the way, we my, were... my beard game is very strong. Oh, yeah, you're crushing me on the beard game. I don't even try. The beard, my beard thing doesn't work at all. Look at that crap beard. <laughs> um, but the, uh, uh, we, this is the recovery expedition. Um, we went and recovered the Apollo 11 uh, Saturn V F1 engines from the bottom of the Atlantic under 14,000 feet of water. They'd been resting there peacefully for more than four decades. And we did it. Um, uh, it, was, it, it, was a, it was an incredible adventure. Um, the captain, there were 60 people on the boat, uh, including our mother, Jackie, and uh, she was the only woman on the boat. So it was 59 men and my mom. And when I first got on the boat, the captain came and found me. And uh, this is a big 300-foot boat with, you know, a moon pool and, and diving submersibles, remotely operated vehicles, very high tech. The captain came, a very nice Norwegian guy, and he said, um, I, we've never had a woman on the boat before, and I've taken the liberty of removing all of the pornography from the common areas, and I just wanted to make sure that's okay with you. And I was like, yeah, that sounds good. That's fine. <laughs> that's good. I never did find that stash. <laughs> um, 
And so, so we, we were successful. We recovered those engines. And uh, where, so where are they? One of them is at the uh, Smithsonian, and one of them is at the Seattle Museum of Flight. Yeah, well, uh, hopefully there'll be some other uh, five-year-old who runs into them and uh, is yes. inspired uh, as you were. Yeah, um, they're incredible engineered objects. I mean, still today, there's probably no rocket engine that has been more successful than the Saturn V F1. So, um, you know, one of the, as, as I was putting this together and looking at all of these pictures and, um, you know, thinking about the adventures that, that we've had together and, um, you know, I, again, you know, knowing how much uh, time and effort you put into Amazon and the Washington Post and uh, Blue Origin, um, and, uh, you know, I also happen to know that you're a devoted husband and beloved father with your, your kids. You have a fantastic relationship. Um, the Bezoses have a lot of kids. He we, has four, I have four, our sister has three. Yeah. We're making sure that the population doesn't go but down. We need, we need to go into space. Yeah. Um, well, one of the, I guess one of the questions I have is, you know, how do you go about establishing that work-life balance that everybody, you know, talks about and thinks about? You've got, I mean, you live a big life, right? I and how do, this, you, how do you I get this question it? a lot. I get it. I teach um, senior executive uh, kind of leadership classes at Amazon for our most senior uh, uh, execs. And I also teach, or not teach, but I also speak to um, interns. So kind of all across the spectrum. And I get this question about work-life balance all the time from, from both ends of the spectrum. And the, my view is I don't even like the phrase work-life balance. I think it's misleading. I like the phrase work-life harmony because I know that if I am energized at work, happy at work, feeling like I'm adding value, um, part of a team, whatever energizes you, that makes me better at home. It makes me a better husband, a better father, and likewise, if I'm happy at home, it makes me a better employee, a better boss, all the things. It's not about, it's not primarily about, there may be crunch periods where it's about the number of hours in the week, but that, that's, not the, that's not the real thing. Usually it's about, do you have energy? And is, the, is your work depriving you of energy or is your work generating energy for you? And you know, there are people, everybody in this room knows people you, who fall into these two camps. You're in a meeting and the person comes in the room. Some people come into the meeting and they add energy to the meeting. Other people come into the meeting and the whole meeting just deflates. And those people just, they, they, they drain energy from the meeting. And you have to decide which of those kinds of people you're gonna be. Are you gonna add energy? Um, and the uh, same thing at home. And the same thing at home. And it's a, so it's a wheel, it's a cycle, it's a flywheel, it's a circle, it's not a balance. Because a balance, that's why that metaphor is so dangerous because it implies there's a strict trade-off and um, you could be out of work, have all the time for your family in the world, but really depressed and demoralized about your work situation, and your family wouldn't want to be anywhere near you. They would wish you would take a vacation from them. And so it's not about the number of hours, not primarily. I suppose if you went crazy with, you know, 100 hours a week or something, yeah, that maybe, right. maybe there are limits. and they probably, but I've never had a problem... Um, and I think it's because both sides of my life give me energy, and, and I, I, that's what I would recommend, and that's what I do recommend to interns and execs. So um, we're out of time. I just want to uh, say that, um, you know, first of all, thank you all for joining us around the proverbial fire pit. <laughs> uh, It's, it's, it's not lost on me that uh, I'm incredibly, uh, it, it brings me joy to have the opportunity to have conversations like this with you often. Uh, and I do cherish those opportunities. And me, this me is too, just, brother. just one more. So uh, thank you very much. Thank all of you. I guess there's just one more thing to say. We should toast. Yep. To adventure, to adventure and fellowship. And fellowship.